Hi, I'm Mary Beth, and this is Keegan, our Northern Sawit Owl. Keegan is one of our educational ambassadors. She came to us last May. She was found in a horse barn, surrounded by six hungry barn cats. She was backed into a hay bale for protection when the owner of the barn came down and found the cats huddled about her. It was found that she had a shoulder and a wrist injury. And although they healed nicely, the wrist injury prevents her from spreading her wing out fully. And it also makes her flight rather noisy. And for those reasons, this bird is not a releasable bird. Northern solid owls. You look at this little bird and so many people think, oh, look how small that bird is. It must be a baby. But this bird is indeed full grown. We know she's a female because she's on the large side for a northern sawwet owl. So size doesn't always determine age when it comes to your owls. As a young bird, this bird looks a little different than we see today. They're one of the few owls that when they first get their feathering, they are colored differently than the adults. They have bright white eyebrows and a dark brown back with sort of a yellowish colored belly. And they molt out before winter and get the adult coloration. They are one of the few owls that does migrate. Usually it is the female and the young that do the migrating. It seems that the male stays back and protects the territory. They are cavity dwellers. They like to live in holes in trees. So they don't make any fancy nests. Their food items include little mice, field voles, and maybe an item as big as a cardinal when they are on migration. So it's usually the female and the young that migrate. Many times your owls, your raptors will mate for life, but this little bird is a bit different. She's more of what we call a nomadic, a wanderer. She may nest in southern Canada one year, but the next year, flying back from her migration down south, she may stop in Maine if there is a male saw wet owl offering a nice nesting territory and perhaps a nice fat vole. They are a bird that likes our cone bearing trees, our pine trees and such. In fact, one of the ways this little bird protects itself is by playing pine cone. Being a smaller bird, she could be prey for many larger raptors. So she does something called playing pine cone, where she draws herself up very thin and narrow, and she closes those eyes, those big bright eyes you might see otherwise, and she backs up against the trunk of a tree, and she looks just like a pine cone. Being a small bird, you think, she probably can't fly very far or maybe isn't even a strong flyer, but this bird has actually been found 70 miles off the coast of Maine on islands. So she is a very, very feisty little bird. Now she gets her name, people say, from the sound of a saw being wetted or sharpened on a stone. In Connecticut, these birds are on what is called the least concern list. We don't see as many as we used to. And probably a couple reasons for that. These birds really like the cedar forest. Cedar trees in Connecticut were wiped out uh, due to a disease. So we don't have as many of those cedar forests for this bird to nest in. Also, there are larger owls like our eastern screech owl and our barred owls that also like to live in holes and trees and live in the woods. So they could also prey upon this little bird. Being small, if she lives through the first year of her life, about 80% of raptors don't. It's tough out there learning to hunt and avoiding predators. This little bird might live four to seven years in the wild, if that. In captivity, we have known them to live upwards of 15. Hi everybody, this is Jeannie here again, and I have Oscar with us today. So just before this you saw Keegan, who was the smallest owl that you would see in New England. This would be the largest one that we have nesting in New England. 
And Oscar is with us because about 13 years ago now, I believe it was, Oscar was struck by a garbage truck. That's why he has his name, Oscar. And this happened down in the southern part of the state. And this garbage truck hit Oscar, heard a thump. And they didn't really stop. They looked around. They didn't really stop and see anything in the road. And they kept on driving all the way up to the Hartford landfill. And when they opened the door at the Hartford landfill, they heard another thump. And that was Oscar hitting the ground. Well, what happened to Oscar was he struck that garbage truck so hard that he got himself wedged in between the mirror and the door. So it was good news and bad news for Oscar when he got himself wedged in between the door and the mirror. And the good news was that he wedged himself in there so he wasn't, um, on, didn't fall off of the truck and get struck by another vehicle laying in the road. But the bad news was he hit that garbage truck so hard that he actually shattered his shoulder. So even though you're seeing Oscar here and he looks pretty good, he's got two wings, Oscar can't fully open that one wing up. So it's almost as if he only has one wing. So Oscar doesn't have real good balance. So in his aviary here at Horizon Wings where he stays, he's got to have a ramp and purchase set up so that if he does lose his balance, he's not going to injure himself again. So that's why Oscar now stays with us at Horizon Wings. So you are looking at the great horned owl, and he's named that for these feather tufts that he has on the top of his head. Um, those aren't his ears, they are just for feathers, and they're used for camouflage and communication. So camouflage, that's a big word, kids, and that just means that he's going to blend into his surroundings. So if you can imagine him up in a tree, you're not going to really see this bird at all with all that different color that he's got on him. He blends right into the trees. And those feather tufts just help. It makes him look like part of the tree. And I say communication as well. And sometimes he flattens those feather tufts out. That's how you can tell that they're not in a real good mood. And when they're up and alert like that, he's fine. So a great horned owl here, he's called the tiger of the woods. And not just because of the coloring that he has on him, but because of his personality. So this bird here, very aggressive bird out there. He's a big bird. Nobody wants to mess with a great horned owl out there. So and I keep saying he for this bird, and you just learned with Keegan, I believe, that Keegan was a female due to her size, and that's how you could tell. Same thing with Oscar. You can tell that this is a male you're looking at because he's actually on the small side for great horned owls. He only weighs about three and a half pounds, and a female can weigh up to five pounds. So definitely looking at a male great horned owl. So some things about great horned owls is that they don't build their own nests. They like to take over somebody else's nest and they nest very early in the season. So they're going to be nesting in January time frame. So they might take over an old red-tailed hawk's nest or a crow's nest, maybe even an eagle's nest. So those eagles come back to start nesting around the same time and they might see these tufts of feathers sticking up in their nest and say, nope, not going to mess with that great horned owl and they'll build another nest somewhere else. So because they take over nests, they're not real sturdy a lot of times. So when they get in them, they have to deal with uh, a lot of branches that are falling down and whatnot. So a lot of times those nests don't last too long when you get the great horns in there nesting. So they're nesting in January, I said, so they're having babies. The babies are hatching out in February, and you're going to start seeing what's called branching happen with the babies, where they come out and start flapping their wings. And you're going to learn more about that in a book that we're going to read shortly. But some things that this bird here, he might like to eat out in the wild. So he eats a lot of, a lot of different things. There you go, that's the hoot owl. That's what, another name for him. But some of the things that Oscar would like to eat, they're really opportunistic birds. They like to eat a lot of different things from rodents and squirrels, and muskrats, maybe even some ducks and waterfowl. But their favorite thing to eat, kids, is black and white. It's nocturnal like he is, it's kind of big, it's slow moving, and it stinks. And everybody at home is going, ew, yep, that's right, it's a skunk. That's one of their favorite things to eat. It's easy for them to capture, and they have a really good meal. And you're saying, how does he lift a skunk up? A skunk can weigh up to nine pounds. And that's because they got really strong toes. We learned that in another episode that we talked about how their toes are special. He can lift a nine pound skunk up into a tree tuck it into a tree and he has a few meals that he can eat with later, but one of their favorite things. And you're saying, doesn't that smell bother him? Nope, they don't really have a sense of smell. They have 
very large eyes, very large ears, and not really much sense of smell. Our story today is Baby Owl's Rescue, written by Jennifer Keats Curtis and illustrated by Laura Jacques, a Connecticut resident. This book is going to teach you what to do if you find a baby bird on the ground, much like we did in the past day. One warm April evening, Maddie grabbed a bat, a ball, and two mitts, and ventured into the yard to practice catching pop-ups with her little brother Max. As they trotted toward the back fence, Maddie heard a funny noise. Clack, clack, clack. What was it? It sounded like fingernails tapping on a tabletop. Clack, clack, clack. There it was again. Maddie was sure it was coming from beneath the pine tree in the far corner of the yard. She flung down her mitt, put a finger to her lips, and shushed Max. As she crept closer, she saw something gray and fuzzy. Were those feathers? Yes, huge, bright yellow eyes peered up at her from inside a feathery, ruffled little ball. Maddie could see a sharp beak, furry feet, and big, long talons. Clack, 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 continued the baby owl, clapping its pointed bill quickly, warning Maddie to go away. Even though the baby owl was cute and cuddly, Maddie and Max knew that it was important not to treat a wild animal as a pet. Fortunately for Maddie and Max, their mother was a wildlife rehabilitator, trained to care for injured wild animals. The children knew that a baby bird on the ground might not need human help. Its parents were probably nearby. Wanting to do what was best for the baby owl, they ran to get their mother. As soon as her mother saw the yellow eyes, she knew what type of owl the children had found. She pointed to the feathery horns beginning to grow. It's a great horned owl, she whispered excitedly. She reminded her kids that, that, that they had heard a pair of great horned owls calling to each other after the new year. Great horned owls nest earlier than other birds, often laying their eggs as early as January, even with snow on the ground. Throughout the long, cold winter, the whole family had heard the woo 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 as the parents softly called to each other. Then once the babies hatched, the parents became silent. How old is he, Mom? Max whispered. I think he's a brancher. He is just leaving the nest. Why is he on the ground? asked Maddie. What should we do? Max asked worriedly. Their mother smiled and silently pointed up. Near the top of a very tall tree, the kids could just make out a nest of messy sticks. He was either blown out of his nest by those strong winds last night, or he fell as he was hopping from branch to branch. Let's see if he's old enough to climb back into the nest himself. Be careful not to talk around the baby or touch him. If he has too much contact with humans, it will be too hard for him to live in the wild. As Maddie and Max quietly backed out of the bird's sight, their mother pulled on a pair of old, heavy brown gloves and gently placed the baby owl close to the base of the pine tree. She hoped he was old enough to use his big beak and large feet to climb up the tree and then to flap and hop his way back into his nest. As his mother lifted the owl, Max realized how tiny the baby really was. He had puffed up his feathers to look bigger in an attempt to scare them away. Maddie and Max had seen animals that might be enemies of a baby owl, raccoons, foxes, and even the neighbor's dog. The safest place for this baby was back in his nest. For several minutes, the baby owl peered at the tree through bright yellow eyes. Then he looked back expectantly, as if he was thinking, and now what? He was clearly too small to scale the tree. Their mom would have to give him a hand. Grinning, their mother asked her children to make sure no other animals came near the baby owl as she ran into the house. A moment later, she returned with a laundry basket. She intended to make the baby a new nest. 
Maddie and Max helped their mother fill the basket with small branches. Maddie and Max had seen their mother make a phone call, but were surprised when two firefighters arrived in a shiny red and white cherry picker truck. As they and several neighbors watched, one of the firefighters put on a helmet and climbed into the cherry picker basket. Using her heavy gloves, their mother placed the owl in the basket nest and then handed it to the firefighter. He rose high in the air until he was several feet under the nest from which the baby had fallen. He carefully placed the basket in the crook of the tree and tied it just below the old nest. To help the owl parents find their baby's new nest, Maddie and Max's mother turned on a CD of owl baby noises. There's the adult. We, we, we went the recording. It worked. As everyone watched, the mother owl soared overhead. The big bird landed on a branch. Ignoring her audience, the mother owl twisted her head and peered into the laundry basket. Powerfully, the mother owl swooped off again in search of a mouse, a gopher, or a lizard to feed her hungry baby. The neighbors filed away one by one. However, Maddie, Max, their mother, and the firefighters wanted to see what would happen next. Just as the street lights came on, Maddie spied the mother owl again. Thanks to the glow of the lamppost, all could see the mouse tail hanging from her mouth. Max heaved a sigh of relief. The baby would eat. Game on, laughed one of the firefighters. Maddie grabbed her bat. Smiling, Max threw the ball for his sister. 